Right, I think we're we're getting there. Okay, cool. Uh, Right, you guys ready? Yep. <laughs> yep. Sure. Um, where did it go? <laughs> oh no. Where did it go? Oh. I'm not oh. sure how long I'll be out of last. It's, it's 9 p.m. here now. <laughs> oh, I've got all night. Okay. We might have to delay this to tomorrow. <laughs> We're going. We are live on Facebook after about half an hour of trying to work it out. Welcome everyone to the Useless AFL Stats podcast live on Facebook. Finally, uh, joining me, my name is Della. Joining me is Liam and Bill. G'day Della. Hey guys. How are you going Aaron? Good. We've, we're finally there. We finally got it up and working. We had a few technology issues, but we got there. So um, it's been a huge week, uh, round 17, seemed to go on forever, nearly as long as it took us to get this, uh, this stream up and running. Uh, we started way back on Thursday night, and of course we finished uh, last night over in the West, over where I am. Yeah, it was a long round, Della, but, but not the longest ever. Um, there was some fairly long rounds back during sort of just before World War II um, that took almost three weeks to complete. And um, if you want to look at the modern era, 2013, 2014, the opening rounds were split across multiple weeks. So they took, you know, 10 and 11 days to finish. So this one was a long round, but but not historically long. Okay. Of course, last year in COVID, we had the, the footy frenzy where we just had game after game or day after day. It felt like a, a footy frenzy. Yeah, we had a couple of Wednesday, Wednesday night games, which are pretty rare. So... I'm surprised that that didn't come up in, in the in the results there, but it's always good to have footy on every single night. Yeah, for sure. I actually went and had a look at uh, West Coast's Monday record, thinking they may have played some Monday games last year, but they hadn't. They they have, uh, however, played six now six Monday games and have, they've lost their last five. So um, apart from the uh, the White Guernseys, which they seem to have a phobia of, they may also have a Monday phobia as well mm -hmm. and we know um, that we know they've already got a cardinia park phobia as well uh just just a quick message to people watching uh you can send in a comment of a stat that you want answered and we'll as as we're going through uh i'll be figuring them out in the background and we will endeavor to get back to you to your question as soon as possible if it's feasible within <laughs> uh within the timeline um i'll i will certainly let you know Cool. So I wanted to start on um, the many milestones this round. I think we had 11. Um, we had three captains with milestones. We had Max Gorn with his 150th. We also had Nat Fife with his 200th and Dane Zorko with his 200th. I was hoping all the captains were going to have wins, but um, Brisbane sort of let Dane Zorko down a bit. He, he had a good game, but the rest of them didn't. And, course um didn't help though they had uh, some injuries in that one either so um but 11 we had the the 50 the 100 the 150 and the 200 with the the first game of the round three melbourne players and stephen motlock with his 200th that was that was pretty rare bill you were right across across that one i think it was the sixth time yeah it was the sixth time that there's been a 50th 100th 150th and 200 in the one game um and there's been a couple of times where there's been four unique milestones in a game that wasn't that composition. Um, so the 50, 100, 200, 250, something like that. So something happened nine times ever. So yeah, pretty rare, pretty rare territory. We've already got a few people joining us. Someone reckons we're, one of us is swamp, but uh, that is 100% not true. We probably wish we were a swamp, but uh, definitely not. Just... Just three guys looking up useless stats from time to time. Um, I did also want to mention quickly the um, Gold Coast having their first ever one-point win. Now, Gold Coast have played a couple of hundred games, and I was meant to look up and see if, if that was the, 
the longest for any team, but maybe I'll throw that over to one of you two guys to try and work out. I sort of look at one point wins in AFL as doing the least possible effort to get a victory. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can definitely uh, just to re- jump in, just to okay. jump in real quick. You got we one. It. Yeah, we got a question from Norman Jupp the third. Most different jumpers worn by a player. Bergwijn would have to be up there. So what we can go on here is more about jersey numbers. So yeah. we obviously know that there have been a couple of players that have uh, played for four different clubs. So Tom Hickey, I believe, is the most recent to play for four different clubs. But we have Jack Reagan, who's played in 11 different jumper numbers. Well, uh, I reckon, if, if I'm right, I reckon he probably played for Collingwood. Because mm-hmm. Col- Collingwood, when they first started, and I can see some names there like um, Fonzie Kine and Gordon Coventry, they were definitely uh, Collingwood yeah. guys. They used to give out the jumpers based on um, alphabetical order. So um, if you were your name was first alphabetically, you got number one. And um, it went on like that to the rest of the team. So that's probably why he ended up with 11 different uh, jumpers there. Yeah. Zam, you said you're talking about one point margins. Um, throughout the week, we got a question about which player has played in the most consecutive games determined by one point. Oh, yes. Um, and it has been done. Uh, has been done three times in a row by two separate players. Oh wow, that's um, pretty. And amazing. I, I didn't write down who it was. So, <laughs> but that's the record. Okay. I don't think anyone's on a streak at the moment, so I don't think it's any current players. Uh, maybe maybe Gold Coast can get a two point win this week. Start something. It'd be pretty amazing. I'm surprised it's only two because you'd think if it happened, potentially they could all be in the same team, like you know, 10 or 12 players, but maybe they played a game, missed a few or got suspended and came back and it just worked. Yeah, they weren't in, in sequences. Like you sort of had to play one, miss a few, play and, and get lucky. Um, yeah. Uh, we well, also just got a question in the, in the Facebook about the number of play or who has gotten 30 touches, 10 clearances and, and two goals in a game. I'm not sure if you saw that question come through. Um, a few players have done it. The player who has done it the most is Gary Ablett Jr. Um, with Lots nine games. Um, and then Patrick Dangerfield and, and Josh Kennedy um, have done it six times. Um, 57 players have done it all up. Oh, well. It's a heap. You've already done that stat for me. I, I can skip that one. Unfortunately, <laughs> uh, unfortunately <laughs> for me, eight of eight of those nine games were when it was at the Gold Coast. Um, yeah. Well, I've got one that you can't really look up, um, not not by any uh, through any database, but um, Brandon Ellis for Gold Coast had. Unfortunately, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> well, someone's got some feedback on. Nine uh, Brandon Ellis had forty-one disposals. He didn't have any of them inside the fifty-meter arc for the Gold Coast, and the only way you can really check these stats is by um, having a look at their heat maps on on the AFL app or on the AFL website but I did remember through my uh, um, support of Frio remembering um, Jakey Lloyd he had a game against Frio where he had 41 disposals and I remember it well because Frio got slaughtered and I was watching it in the pub in uh, Subiaco but um, he, he he had 28 of them in defensive 50 13 of them in the in the middle of the ground, so between the two arcs, obviously zero, none of them uh, in the inside 50, but he actually only had three of his 41 possessions uh, forward of the centre line. And of those three, he actually kicked a goal from about 55 metres out. So um, Brandon Ellis is not the first player to have 41 disposals and none of them inside forward 50. And there could be others, but uh, that one just sprung to mind when I had a quick look. So a goal from outside 50 doesn't count as a inside 50, does it? Is that... Um, well, it's, that not a possession, it's not a possession inside it's the 50. It's not a possession inside 50. Yeah, it would count as an inside 50, but you would not get it on your heat map. It would present as outside 50. As outside 50. I gotcha. 
Anyway, his his heat mat was just dots everywhere inside the defensive fifty. It was amazing. He had uh, ninety one and a half percent D fifty possessions and eight percent somehow um, forward fifty. So there you go. There you go, indeed. Um, we have had a question of the most bounces in a game. Uh, oh, yes. That record goes to Nathan Bock. He had 20 bounces in a 2009 round five game. Um, truly, truly extraordinary. And you can see also in the top three, Jason Graham, Heath Shaw, and Boomer Harvey, Bruce Shaw, Chris Yaron, Leo Barry, Montagna. <clears throat> uh, all very high bounces. So thanks to Adam Matthews for sending in that question. And we're getting a stack of them on Facebook as well. Plenty, plenty of people asking a lot of questions. We'll probably have to go through these a bit later on to check, see if we can give some answers out. Um, while we're while we're quite fresh, and maybe it'll give you guys a chance to um, look up some more answers. Maybe I'll read out the uh, the mo votes. We haven't put these up on Facebook yet, and I know there's a few people getting around the the brown mo medal. We're getting close to the end of the season. So it's a, it's a very prestigious award. I'm actually keen to um, maybe send something out to the club of the winner and see if, um, see if the Brown Mo is well received by whoever does get the, the win. But this week, uh, either of you guys want to have a guess who I gave the five to? Oh, geez. I would have gone Zach Tui, but I'm not sure where you've gone, Bella. I only watched one game, so. Oh, well, wow. you were busy on the weekend. Um, yes, you were right, Zach Tui. So he got it mainly for his double moustache tweak. Uh, that sealed the top votes for him. He, however, he, he did kick two goals. So um, he's incorporated a moustache tweak into his uh, preset shot routine. Um, he had 24 disposals at 87% efficiency and eight marks. And he, he called his moustache colour after the game Moroccan Sunset. But um, it's not an official color moroccan sunset he is actually uh officially spicy mix i um i color picked his mustache so he is his mustache is is actually spicy mix it's a shade of brown so there you go uh the four votes gave it to teammate tom stewart he was right behind tui with another great game 25 disposals 619 meters gain 10 intercepts 12 marks so he is closed in. We'll get to the uh, the leaderboard shortly. We've got three votes to Bailey Smith. Um, he had a good game despite being in the losing side. He was probably one of the dog's best midfielders. They were a bit quiet. The McRae, McRae lost his uh, sequence of 30 disposals. Um, we also, he had 27 disposals, six marks, three tackles, one goal and a goal assist. Um, good game by the man with a million Instagram followers. Two votes to Jake Lloyd, um, despite BT saying he picks up lots of cheapies on the kickouts. Lloyd was a real general down back for Sydney and instrumental in helping them upset the Cats. He had nine marks and 33 disposals. Not his, not anywhere near his, his best, but, but a good game. And I gave the one vote, I was tossing up between two players here. I could have gone either way, but I gave it to Cozzy Pickett. Uh, could have easily given it to Cam Zerha, but uh, Pickett was a real live wire. His his stats aren't up there with his Mo rivals, but um, he had a huge impact. Nine disposals, nine tackles, three goals, and of course that one where the advertising banner tracked tracked the ball into goal was quite amazing. So uh, one to him, and the honourable mentions: Scott Lyset, Isaac Smith, Daniel McKenzie, Ben Long, and Bailey Dale. So whipping through the leaderboard, Tom Liberatore is on 27, Tom Stewart's on 26, Taylor Walker 23, Jake Lever and Bailey Dale all on 21. So now you there. use the, um, the quality of the moustache as like a tiebreaker when you can't split games. And I think Zach Tui's moustache is probably up there now with the best in the league. So um, I campaign for him every week to get votes and his moustache is getting better every week. So I think he'll come home strong. If I, think, I get my way, I think he's up to 14. We've got six games left. So, in theory, if someone had six best on grounds for the Brown Mo, they could pick up 30 votes. So, in theory, someone that has never polled a vote could still win it. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Very disappointing to see that uh, Lockie Jones has gone out with a, uh, I believe, a long-term injury uh, for yes. Adelaide youngster. So that that's truly disappointing. We won't be able to see him on the on the leaderboard. He could have been uh, a rising brown mo medal. A rising brown mo that could. Uh, it's very so, unfortunate. Sort of look like you're trying to win it yourself there, Liam. Actually, you you've been ruining that. Over the last <laughs> yeah, few weeks. yeah. I I reckon if I if I get rid of the rest of the beard, I mean I am going for a pretty like a homeless statistician look. But <laughs> if I reckon if I get rid of the beard, it's just going to look absolutely filthy. So I might I might bring it out for the final round when we do when we get all dressed up. Uh, of course, the day before, maybe the night before Brownlow, we do the Brown Mo Awards. Um, maybe um, I'll grow one too. Maybe you'll grow one. Oh God. Yeah. When okay, when, maybe not. <laughs> when we go into lockdown, I refuse to shave. So oh, um, I've, ha- yeah. I've had a I've had a few good beards going in the last eighteen months, but um, then unfortunately, you've got to go back to work. Yeah, very yeah, unfortunate. All right. Um. Oh, I wanted to give out the other colours. Um, I posted up all the brown my contenders on Facebook and um, various shades of, of brown. These are of, um, accurately colour picked off their moustaches through um, Photoshop. And then I, um, I used a colour matching um, applicator to get all the shades. So if anyone was playing along, the lightest of the colours was Santa Fe. That was, of course, Tom Stewart's moustache. Of course, of course. A lot of people got that, I believe, on Facebook. The second lightest, which was dark tan, was um, Bailey Dales. Again, that was probably an easier one to get, although some people picked Zach Tui with that one. Uh, number three, of course, was Spicy Mix and not Moroccan Sunset, as Zach Tui calls his moustache. It's definitely Spicy Mix. Number four... Uh, was the Mocha Chino. That is Jake Lever, um, sort of like a Mocha, mocha colour. Number five, which is the Chi, I can't even say it, Chiocolato. That is Tom Liberatore, one of my favourite Brown Mai players, although I am, I don't, I don't have any bias when I come to pick the, the winners each week. And the, the brownest is the brown pod that is Taylor Walker. That is, if you look at their hair colors, you should be able to get that one. But um, I don't know if anyone playing along on Facebook got all six of those. We'll have to check that out tomorrow, but there you go. Um, I've got a stat here for you, Aaron. Cool. So we had one come in through the comments. Uh, Gamana James Bagama. How many times has Richmond lost after being up 20 plus Oh, at three quarters. Uh, sorry, I'll switch these numbers around. Stop so, it you idiot. <laughs> so we want to see how many times uh, they've been up at three quarter time by 20 points. So greater than the 20 point margin. And we're going to compare that to the final score. Yeah, so they were up against Collingwood by, I don't know, 29 at some one point. And they got rolled. Yeah. That was yeah, a... they were an absolutely... That was one of my that was one of my six losing tips across the weekend. Yeah, terrible day for tippers at the moment. Uh, so we're going to take a look. So Richmond, been a couple it? of times where they've been up twenty games now. So twenty one if you include the most recent game. Well, they so got one of their they got beat by twenty one. One times. of their worst losses. So the quarter, the third quarter margin. They were up by 23 in 1946 round four and then ended up losing by 21. So it's the 21st time the Richmond have led by 20 putts. Uh, well, it looks like there was a final in there that you scrolled past, actually. Uh, yes, 1933 semi final. Yeah, Very tragic end. loss. I remember. Tragic it. loss. Who was that uh, against? Uh, Fitzroy, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, oh. There's no more useless stat than stats including involving Fitzroy. <laughs> we love them, don't we? It's good when a Fitzroy yeah. comes up. Or university blues come up in the uh, 
in the yeah. history. I always love that too. Yeah, mm-hmm. They don't come up in winning games. So. No. <laughs> uh, the same final loss was against Sydney, but oh. uh, of course, back then it was South Melbourne. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's great to see. Great to see. Um, and we can also look at the all-time record. What's the largest loss uh, after being 20, 20 points up? Goes to North Melbourne versus Essendon in 1941. North Melbourne up by 28 points, ended up losing by 37. So that's quite the turnaround. That's almost like a 10-goal turnaround. Oh, Truly wow. North Melbourne-esque, um, quintessential North Melbourne. Mm-hmm. I'm interested in one that came through on uh, in our inbox on Facebook. Um, some astute person picked it up. I'll get his name. It was uh, Tom Tom Bury. Tom Bury. Tom Bury. Yeah, I've got that one for you. Do you want me to? Yeah, to do that? that was you can you can kick that one off. Yeah. So Tom Bury asked, as David some subs on for DD, they both have identical stat lines. Is this a first? That's been five kicks, two handles, four marks, and one tackle. So they've been able to. They've come in and replaced uh, replaced the player. Yeah. So we've had that happen a couple of times. Oh well, they're probably zero. Is it? Uh, no, not quite. So then two, a couple of times. So I think this is this might be across teams. So yeah, it is. Well, uh, Xavier Ellis, Sam Doherty, I believe they're on the different yeah, teams. Hawthorne and Brisbane. Uh, player team. I can put that into our goodbye here. It's like watching it's like watching Mozart play. <laughs> I'm gonna have well, a I'm gonna have a cat on my screen in a minute. There we go. It seems like that's never never happened before. Wow. So, but so, across teams. So do it across teams. Across teams. We'll we'll uh we'll have so a look. You're, so you're looking for a player who is subbed out of one team and a player who was subbed into the other team that had identical stat lines. Yes. Oh. Yes, essentially. Yeah. To sort it by kicks because that'll be... Oh, well. So, oh, there you go. Here we go. So we have Xavier Ellis for Hawthorne subbed out uh, and Sam Doherty also subbed out and they both have the same stat line. Oh, so that's, that's, good... the kinda, that's the kind of areas we're getting into here. Well, that's one um, subbed out, both subbed out. Six. So that Adelaide one on the weekend was one player subbed out and then the subbed in player then went and matched them. And went and matched them. Yeah. Yep. That um, appears to be the first time ever, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes, that does. Um, we got to put that up on Facebook tomorrow. Tom Rockliffe got subbed out uh, and Jared, Jared Garlett also got subbed out for so, uh, Brisbane uh, and Gold Coast, respectively. Is there any both having a stat line of all zeros? Is there any um, sub outs and sub ins there? Um, Need to widen that column. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, our studio is really bad <laughs> at, at, at this type of thing, unfortunately. So I can hover over and I can tell you. Um, Matt Tabernar, Fremantle, uh, subbed out. Jake Lloyd, Sydney, subbed in. And they both got the exact same scroll line. Jake Stat Lloyd line. was subbed in. How long ago was that? Yes, that was 2014, know. round five. Wow. That was surprising. He got subbed in. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Wonder how many kickouts he took. <laughs> Must have been many back then. All right, uh, I have to get it? you to send me all that. Cat. Yeah, oh, all it's all here, ready to go. Uh, one more, real quick one. <clears throat> Jackson Lowe was wondering if you guys know when the most wins team has had and still finished with the wooden spoon. Uh, North a chance to beat it this year. Oh yes, I did. I did have a look. It's and like four or five wins. It goes to Collingwood, 24 points, six wins in 1976. Well, the funny thing is, North, if North get to six wins, they probably won't win the wooden spoon because they'll, they'll probably, yeah. they could leapfrog Hawthorne, Collingwood, or Adelaide. Yeah. So the 1976 season that, uh, that we're referencing here, the team on top was Carlton, 16 wins, one draw, five losses and still ended up in first place. So what we're looking for is a more compressed uh, ladder. So Collingwood ending up on the bottom of the ladder with a percentage of 86. Well, six wins, 16 losses. So with all the work the AFL has done towards equalization, we're sort of seeing that it was potentially more equal in 1976 than now. 
There was also less teams, but... Yeah, also less teams. Anyway. That also helps. Well, they should get rid of some teams. I've been saying it for years. <laughs> All of the non-Victorian teams should be booted out. <laughs> yeah, the, the Victorian teams should form their own Super League of sorts and call it okay. the VFL. Where they can play against all each other. Yeah. That's a it's a good name for it. We got a question on Facebook from Peter McKenna. Wonder if he's the ex champion Peter McKenna. Probably a different Peter McKenna, I'd guess. Uh, what is the most long sleeve jumpers worn in a single match? We've asked, we've been asked this one a few times, and that was um, a, f- a game down at Cadinia Park where it was just about hailing, and Fremantle played them and got. Absolutely belted. And every single Fremantle player ran out onto the ground with, in a long sleeve jumper in the second half. Well, if it wasn't a jumper, it was the old shirt, long sleeve shirt under a under a jumper. I think some of them had long sleeve jumpers and long sleeve shirts on. But even Pav, Sandlands, they all had well, they all had the long sleeve on. And about half of Geelong's team also had long sleeves on. All the, the, the traditional long sleeve wearers like Jimmy Bartell definitely had it on. And I think there's um there's definitely a YouTube video of that game. So if anyone uh, wants to check that out, they can definitely we've have just a look had at a, that. I've just had a stat come in as a, as a private message um, oh. about the most bounces um, ever in a season. Um, this is from uh, Kieran Thomas. Um Pretty easy one to look up. They've told us uh, accurately that Heath Shaw and Reese Shaw uh, are number one and two in 2009 with 167 and 160 bounces. But what they've highlighted is that they're both very much well clear of third place and they're both far above their previous best seasons. And they've put forward a theory that the Shaw brothers perhaps made a bet before the season um, mm-hmm. as to who could get the most bounces in 2009. Um, I think that's a pretty good theory. Um, Reece Shaw played an extra game, but Heath Shaw had um, seven extra bounces and they're 40-plus they're clear of third place. Well, the way some people grab the ball and take two steps and bounce it, you think think they're, they're in the part of the bet, some of the players. Nathan, uh, sorry, not Nathan Hind, Nick Hind. For Essendon started doing that, I've noticed. All right. Yep. Where, where um, are we, Liam? You got another one? Uh, yeah. So Patrick Mega here. Uh, is looking for how many players since 1990 have had no bounces in their entire career. So oh, I, I can, I can, I've got a good stat right off the top of my head when you finish this. Okay. Okay. Um, the, the interesting one about this one. Oh, I didn't put in season here. So season greater than 1990. So we're going to sum all the bounces over each person. So we get the ID, the first name and the surname of each individual player. Because sometimes you have like Josh, first name, surname Kennedy. And when you're doing database uh, manipulations, it can be quite confusing. You don't want to merge the two Josh Kennedys together. So we have an ID number here. And we can also sum across each of those groups. So we're summing the bounces and we're also just going to sum the disposals to have a bit of, a bit of fun. While you're doing that, one of our milestone men from the weekend uh, has not, never had a bounce. And he's one of the captains. And it's not Nathan Fife and it's not uh, Dane Zorko. It is Max Gorn. Yes, 150 games. Zero bounces. And I've been following him. There's been a few times he's been in the clear and I was like, oh, is this going to be the time? But he has not bounced the ball. And the funny thing is his uh, his protege, um, the man in waiting, Luke Jackson, uh, guess how many games he took to have a bounce? Didn't do it on debut, wow. did he? Debut? Actually... Oh, no, he doesn't have a bounce. I'm sure I saw him bounce the ball. Damn. Um, I've got a result for you, but Aaron, I might have to ask, when was when were bounces first recorded? Uh, in, in about uh, 2002, maybe? Okay, I'm going to have to increase this. So, yeah. we'll, go, we'll go 2005 to be safe. 
think. Oh, he would definitely think, be safe. Yeah, I think, Max Dorn. I think they're an older stat than that. Um, Do you want to just quickly check? check. Yeah, so Max Scorn, Tom Hickey, Hugh Greenwood, Barry Hall, and Curvis round out the top five. <clears throat> so Max Scorn, 2,181 disposals without a bounce. Truly amazing. So we've oh. got quite a few... Um, Backman, Yeruckman, Zach Clark, Matthew Lobb, Sam Rowe. And we got bounces from 1999, uh, Liam. Okay, oh, cool. Cool. We'll see if this Extended updates out. the leaderboard. Uh, we'll Two go good by. things happened in 99. The Matrix 1 came out and they started recording bounces in the uh, AFL. Yeah. Um, the top five hasn't changed. So uh, we still have Max Gorn on top here. Uh, the most disposals and the most games played without a bounce. Yeah. And long may that continue. I'd yeah. be very disappointed if if he registers one now. I do like to keep an eye out on, on Tom Hawkins bouncing. I think he's only got eight or nine career bounces. He's never had two in a game. So on the rare occasion he gets one early, I, I start watching very closely in case he has... Um, a career high two bounces. I think we all have a player like that that we that we love to watch bounce the ball. Um, yeah, I think Hawkins is up to eight bounces. Hasn't had one this year. Another good twist on this stat is just looking at players that have had one bounce, and that goes to Shane Munford. Uh -huh. Two hundred eleven games with one <laughs> bounce. Not only, wow. not only did he get a taste for the bounce, and he successfully completed the bounce. Um, he said. One's enough. That's enough for me. I'm done here. It was over 10 years ago. It was in 2009. Oh, brilliant. Uh, round seven against the Cats. Geelong by 51 points. Shane Mumford with the solitary one bounce. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Whilst playing for Geelong, of course. Um, oh. Yeah, not many people uh, remember those days. I still consider him a Geelong legend, but... Um, good game, um, mate. 18 disposals, four, four tackles. His tackles yeah. stick too. Amazing. Um, I just got a question about the database that we use. So uh, I'm I'm trained as kind of like a as a statistician, and I'm using this program called R. Essentially, what I've done: some very smart people have put together an AFL database online called AFLtables.com, and essentially, I'm just accessing that data, and I'm using database manipulations to essentially select the columns I want. So we can have a look at the raw AFL tables database, which goes back to 191897. And we have each individual player. We have the away teams, their quarter time scores, goals behind each player, their first name, their jumper number, kicks, handles, marks, goals. Um, of course. Back in 1897, there were no stats back then. Uh, it didn't come in until, until the 60s. Until yes. the 60s. 65. But, but if, I, if we just have a look at 2015, for example, all this data is now filled in. So we have columns for each player, how many handballs they've got, how many clearances they've got, contested possessions, uncontested possessions, one percenters. Um, and essentially what I'm doing is sorting by groups of players and I'm, I'm filtering for certain players or certain groups. And we can also find out all these other kind of useless stats. We also uh, got, we've also got umpires. Yeah, we've also got umpires. So we literally have who was the main umpire. Um, I believe this gets filled out towards the end. Yeah, so we can yeah. see which games have certain umpires involved. I've also got these extra extra things here, like who they're playing against, the opposition quarter, possessions, fantasy points, games played, and so forth. But there's this even better, uh, more recent, kind of more champion data-like uh, from this really great guy on Twitter named Fryzy. And he's essentially given us access to even more stats. So we have uh, Mark, like specifically Mark's inside 50, um, time on ground, bounces, super goat scores, score involvements, meters gained, turnovers, um, contest, contest of offensive one-on-ones. Like how many one-on-ones were they in? How many did they win? Um, defensive half pressure acts, 
I don't even know what that means. No one, no one does. No one does, and we love it. We also have their player position as well, where they were subbed, spoils, rating points, AFL rating points, which I really, uh, really enjoy. So that's kind of an overview. So I'm using R to just get in here and access it. We had uh, a question come through from Jacob Landy about what the ratio of kicks to handballs is over time. Um, mm. So, yeah, we can go back to 1965, as you just mentioned, Liam. Um, mm-hmm. the, in, in 65, um, 85% of all disposals were kicks, um, and that's pretty steady throughout the 60s. Um, it starts to sort of trend down in the mid-1970s um, to about 65% by the 90s. Um, it's been as low as 55%. It's now 60%. So um, for every 100 disposals back in the day, 85 would be kicks and you'd see the rare handball, but but now it's more like 60-40. I'll tell you what, if you can get vision of uh, the 1960s or the very early 1970s, um, and you can see players handballing. They actually did like a windmill wind up when they handballed. Um, it's quite amazing to to see how they their techniques, not the little throws they do these days that count as handballs for sure. I've never seen really footage of it, but I've heard from my dad that Polly Farmer used to be able to handball at about 150 meters. Oh, um, that's just anec- that's just anecdotal from from my old man, but um, I understand he could handball at essentially the whole ground. He used to practice handballing through um, moving cars yep. through their windows. That's the old. I assume as they as they came out of the uh, open Ford factory back in the day when Geelong was a lively town, he's just nailing the fresh cars with handballs from kilometres away. Actually, that's a that's a good use of stat the uh, the Geelong Ford connection. So they've been uh, a major sponsor of Geelong ever since they've existed. It's the longest sporting sponsorship in the world so it's still going today which is which is amazing always had the forward good synergy with the with the colors Mm -hmm. i know i've got one that i want liam to bring up i think he's already got it somewhere Mm -hmm. and it came through from william crouch we did um the stat about richmond of course losing uh four games in a row and he wanted to know what's the record for most days since a team lost four in a row. Geelong's currently got a 5,500-day streak going back to 2006. But has any club ever had a longer streak than that? Um, that's That was one of the ones I didn't quite get to, unfortunately. <laughs> so I might have to get back to you on that one. All right. Um, I do have one here ready to go. Uh, so we had a question from the comments on this video. Ben Pollock, how many players have won games by a margin that equals their jumping number? Oh, yeah. So we want to get all the relevant columns. We want to get their, the, their team score and the opposition score. Throw in a quick calculation. And we also want it to be a win. So the win-loss column, we want to make sure that that is a W. So it's going to be someone who's played a lot of games and has a jumper number that's a common sort of margin. So up the top here, 1971, round 20, Ian Craig, jumper number 54, has played, has had a 54-point win in that jumper number. Well, I'll find out who he played for. Ian Craig, I think that might be Sydney. We might be getting mixed up with a different Craig. Uh, playing for Richmond. <clears throat> yeah. Actually, the top three are from Richmond. Wow. John Caulfield and Colin Waterson with 53 and 53 respectively. So they're the top. Sean Wren's had two 52s. Can we get a uh, sum? And, and Ben Brown's had a 50 there. The most mm-hmm. games with the same margin as their jumper? The most games. Ah, oh, Okay. So we're looking for, so looking for each player to see how many wins they've had. Yeah. So it's like a Alistair Lynch wore a jumper eleven. Did he have 
So seven yeah. seven wins by eleven points. By eleven points, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is this just winning margins or losing margins? Um, I've just filtered by wins at the moment. Yep. So we're just winning looking margins. at wins. Uh, Wayne Shane. Schimmelbush has nine wins, and Jordan Lewis has nine wins with their jump number equal to the margin. There you go. So Stephen Silvani eight. He was number one. There you go. John so, Nichols might have been number one too. Wangers, Gavin Wanganin. Um, Hoping so to win go. Survivor, Gavin Wanganin. Oh, Nat Fife's had seven wins by seven wearing number seven. I like that. Oh, I like that. I like that a lot. I'll be happy if they win by seven this, this week. Who are they playing this week? They're playing Geelong. Oh, oh. Thursday. Um, one of those wins might have been when he wore number 13 in his first season. True. Just actually, I can I can just check for that now. Let's uh-huh. let's not beat around the bush. We can also just put that in here. Jump that, was, that was when he was skinny too. Number seven. No, uh, it seems like it was. He had a Jumper number. How far do we have to go for five? Yeah. Here's Seven. Six. Yeah. Six so uh-huh. we can also look for that five. So his, yeah, like I said, his other win came, his other seven point win actually came in another 13. Yep. But he also had a 13 point win. Whilst wearing number 13. Yeah, so he's had six, seven point wins. He needs to have another one to get that up to seven. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Very good. Maybe that can happen this weekend. We'll keep an eye out on it. I'll be a barricade for it for sure. Um, we've done all the ones I've got written down. Yeah. Um, any other talking points from the week we want to get? Um, I've nearly got that longest um, streak without a without a full game loss in a row. Um, bear with me; I'll have it in about a minute or so. Okay, while well, you're doing that, um, I remember you mentioning to me, Bill, that you're going on a um, weight loss program, and your incentive to lose weight was um, based on Geelong's list of players and, and what they weigh. Yep. So we sort of call it in, in the family, you want to hit the Mitch Duncan standard. <laughs> um, so Mitch Duncan's um, player height and weight from memory is 187 and 88 kilos. Um, let me see if I can just get that up. Um, I was rocking around it more of your Gary Rowan. Um, he's 188, 88 Mitch Duncan. So instead of having a scale that tells me how many kilos I am. I instead just sort of look at the Geelong list and see where I'm at. (laughs) Um, So yeah, trying to work down from a, from a Hawkins into the, into the Gary Rowan down into the Mitch Duncan territory now. So I think scales should sort of come that way as well. Um, You're doing doing better than me because I'm above Tom Hawkins. I'm more out of Charlie Dixon. Um, I'll I'll be hoping to get to a Shane Mumford and then, Go through to an Aaliyah or Aaliyah and um, Nat Fife, Jack Darling, Michael Hurley, Bontempelli, Cripps, Steele, Pendlebury. I've got these in a big long list. Ben Keys, Rampy, Luke Parker, Guthrie. That's getting down to like the mid 80s. Bailey Smith, if you really want to look nice and trim, taut, and terrific, he's down on the 80. Mm-hmm. And then um, if you want to get semi anorexic, you can get down to a Liam Henry or one of those type players, a Caleb Daniel, even. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I've got a staff for you, Aaron. Uh, Chris Short, uh, who just commented on our page. Jack Graham, the only player to win when his team scores his jumper number. I assume there's meant to be a question mark at the end here. Um, 35, <clears throat> is he? 35? Jack he's Graham? 34. 34. 34 so, playing. so close. Richmond, uh, back in 2020, had scored 34 points against 
a team. I'll just figure out what that team was, the opposition and the opposition score. Bring that in. Playing for the score. Yeah, Jack Argreo. Where's he going? <laughs> you lost him. He's right Playing down. Playing score, dropping 34. Yeah. Oh, but it's also going to be a win. That's what I missed. Yep. So in a win, specifically. There so is. Jack Graham had 34 versus Sydney's 26. Well, wow. So one of the most recent. But Michael Gibbons, wearing number jump of number 40, is also had their team score 40 and also a win. There's a guy there playing for Carlton, Vin Arthur. He's in jump of 30. And he's still won his game. Quite amazing. 1927, going way back. Well. I've got that record, the longest streak uh, without losing four games in a row. Um, Collingwood hold, holds it. Uh, yeah. um, oh, very sort of time. second time it's come up tonight, which is a bit unusual, but World War II really helped them out. Um, so the record is um, 6,000. I've lost it. It's 347 games. They went without losing four in a row, and it was 6,000. 545 days, which is seven. Well, I said World War II helped them out, but it was an 18 year streak. So I've actually been a bit short on them there. So Geelong, um, Geelong, I've got that within reach. No, Geelong was three, close. Three, yeah. three years to go. But you sort of, it's hard once you reset because you're, yeah, you're always nearly two dec- decades away. Yeah. Um, really? Yeah. So Adelaide and, um, Sorry, I'm um, Collingwood. Yeah, 400. Sorry, 6,500 days. Uh, yeah, that's going to be tough to beat. That was a good, they were a good side through the 30s and 40s, Collingwood. Um, Carlton has a similar streak. Sorry, 5,500 days through a similar period. Um, if you want one that's half recent, um, they are hard to find, but Hawthorne has a streak as well. Um, 5,400 days that ended in the mid-1990s. Uh, you know, lost to St Kilda, broke that streak. Oh, well. Of course, um, Richmond going back-to-back and now sitting 12th. They're, um, and we're going to keep be keeping a real close eye on this one. They're within um, one ladder position of equaling Adelaide's record for back-to-back premiers nosediving down the ladder. Yeah, they are within touching distance of being the worst ever performing team after going back to back. I think they'll break the record too. They look pretty bad at the moment. Yeah. Well, Brisbane hopefully will knock them off. And then after that, um, Carlton and- looks, Carlton looks good. They're, they're, they're coming behind. Gold Coast has had a good win. Um, so the teams behind them are, are coming. So if they drop one position, they tie the record. And if they drop two or more, um, they'll take the record. Yeah, the worry for me is um, they might start getting actually some good players back, but um, we'll, we'll see what happens for the rest of the year. Another um, another thing I've noticed is Charlie Kerno is actually returning to the VFL. Apparently he's going to play a half a game or something uh, for their VFL team. I don't think it's called Carlton, the VFL side. The name escapes me. But um, for players that have played a minimum of 50 games, he's actually got the worst winning percentage of any current player. I think it's about 17%. Um, And I think when he finished his last game, he may have had the record, but a number of Gold Coast players um, were right right there with him. And um, players like Braden Fiorini and um, even Took Miller and those those sort of guys had really bad winning percentages, but they've picked up the pace in the last few weeks. So Charlie, when he gets back for Carlton, will need to get a few wins to to get away from that. The Carlton uh, VFL team is coached by um, Dan O'Keefe, who was Sam Walsh's coach in the Geelong Falcons. Oh, yes. So clearly he can uh, develop young players if he um, helps develop Sam Walsh. Very good. I can see Liam's working on a stat from Andy Munro about who has bounced the least under 183 centimetres. Interesting. Yeah, so thanks to thanks to uh, Freizig, who you can all follow on 
Twitter. He's compiled, compiled the more advanced stats for us, which also includes player height. Um, I'm not sure how he got the player height data. Maybe he scraped it from AFL tables or maybe he just hacked into Champion Data's database. Um, I think I just, um, you can just know all of them if you... If you become obsessed with player heights and weights, you just can just know them all off the top of your head. I believe uh, there's a few other websites that have them. Uh, Footy Wire might have them and um, Zero Hanger might have them as well. I I believe AFL Tables does. but Yeah, they do. It's, but not stuck, in a, it's yeah. stuck up the top um, where you can't readily um, access it. And I'm not sure if players, players' heights would change over time. And we also have access to player weights as well. So I'm assuming the weights would change over time, but I'm not sure at what point in time the stats have been collated for. So um, yeah. we just have to kind of go on with it and we'll see. While you're working on that, I noticed, um, I don't know if you guys watch The Bounce, which comes on Sunday, Arvo's normally after the last game on a Sunday, but um, Cam Mooney's numerology our um, Jake Kelly stat about being player one, two, three, four, five uh, in game 67, having uh, wearing jumper eight and having nine kicks. That got um, that got a run on on the bounce, but someone tweeted it out um, <laughs> after we posted it. And yeah, pretty he, much word for word. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, he gave them credit, which is fine. We, we like the, our stats getting shared. So, that's, um, a, that's a fair one. We might um, we might finish off with this one, Liam. Uh, yeah. So we've summed all the bounces, and then we can have a look at how many have got zero. Has this come in? Has this come in as a quest as a question from somebody? Yes. Yes, Andy. Yes, it does. I'm very curious as to why they've selected 183 centimeters as their. It's a very specific height. Isn't it? mm. It's like the six foot mark, isn't it? 183. Uh, or is that uh, to 181? Be, to be shy. Um, Lockie Schultz. Lockie Schultz. Can we get a quick check on that, please? He's too busy, kicking, he's too busy kicking snags for Frio. Uh, <laughs> if someone can please uh, confirm that for me, that'd be great. Conf- confirm his height. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. Games he's, played, all that stuff. He's definitely not 183. He's 178 right. and he's never had a bounce. It's confirmed. Well, there we go. He's played Mitch Crowden, Will Snelling. He's played 30, 39 games now, too. Oh, it Mitch seems... Crowden. Dockers are dominating here. Yeah. They're allergic to bounces over West. Maybe. Um, no, it, seems, but... it seems that when a player under 183 centimetres doesn't take a bounce, their career doesn't last longer than 38 games. I'm surprised so... Brad Close is on that list. So, <laughs> I'm very yeah, surprised by that. Well... He better get a bounce in somewhere because it's really not looking good. Um, I'll, have a, I'll have to have a word to him. Yeah. He's a long sleeve wearing mustache toting non bouncer. Yeah. It's a rare combination for sure. Yeah. I think he's been done. This is from memory. I think he's been done for running too far without a bounce. I have a memory of that down the broadcast wing. So maybe he just doesn't know how to. Mm-hmm. Sam Fenders. Just- these are all current players. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, the database doesn't have heights for players going back too far, unfortunately. Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah. That, that would make sense as to why that's the case. Oh, there's a few there that would definitely get some bounces under the belt at some point, I'm sure. All right, guys, we might wrap, wrap that up. Thanks to um, those who tuned in via Facebook. There's quite a few. Which was great. Thanks for all the questions. We might have we well, we definitely missed quite a few there. We may um go back through those and, and check them out later. Thanks, Liam, for giving everyone a, a sneak peek at uh at the way we work most of these stats out. And mm-hmm. cheers, Bill. I love your your background with the Gary Ablett stats behind you. Yeah, fifty three disposals right there. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. Take us um, over the other shoulder. Is it? Oh, uh, this is high. This is low forties over here. This is oh, top, okay. top ten disposals. Um, <laughs> it's just sort of at my mustache line. At least five or six goals he kicks. All right, 
so we'll wrap that up and um, we'll be back again next week, I suppose. Yeah. Thanks, mate. See ya.